Hello everybody and welcome back to the Triple Jump podcast. It's a video game podcast. My name is Ben. My name is Peter. Hello Peter. Hello. What's this thing? Oh, I don't know. Technology. It's yeah, straight in there. Fantastic. Didn't even wait for a punchline. No. Just couldn't resist. I thought we might wait until someone did a funny, but you nope. know. Nope. Um, for the benefit of those listening on audio only. We've hired a drummer. Yeah, we've. <laughs> there's a real drummer who... Every single time he does the, uh, he gets it, it sounds identical, yeah. almost as though it's just a little sample being played back. He's a percussion perfectionist. Percussion perfectionist. That's it. There's going to be no more of those no. now and for, for at least half an hour. Yeah. Promise. Okay. That's it. Uh, we've got a new sort of deck. Yeah. What's the word? Uh, it's, it's A mixer. So we've got a mixer. It's yeah. got faders and sliders and buttons and we can program in sound effects and all sorts of other stuff which mm. is very exciting and means we don't have to use if you're watching on camera this anymore which has uh, sort of messed us up on a number of occasions it because it's got a slightly wonkle donkle recording mechanic do you know if this records us in separate channels uh, I think there's an option for that, mm. but I believe we are mixed into one, Ooh, which is okay. why we can customize our individual levels. Yeah. So we don't need to really do much fiddle yeah. faffling around. Hello, welcome. <laughs> oh, hello. <laughs> this is the video game show to end all other video game shows. It's got a confirmed kill count of over 5,000 video game shows. Did you know that? Yeah, what the F did you just call me? I, I have 2,000. I was a Navy SEAL. Confirmed kills. I will send a sniper to your house. You will, you'll get wrecked, son. Yeah. Peter. Mm-hmm. Every week we have a sponsor on this show. We do. They put forth a financial stake in us. It helped us buy this new mixer. They, Yeah, exactly. Mm. They believe in us and what we do. And every week there's a new person who they, they're, they're queuing up around the block, ready to give us money to do this podcast for you. Peter has the ad read for this week. Uh, who is the sponsor, Peter? Uh, it's a small independent company uh, this week from uh, just sort of like rural... Europe. I'm yeah. Not, I'm not saying Spain. Rurup. Rurup. I'm not saying Spain, but it's Spain. Um, okay. Dr. Salvador's tree surgery. Oh. You know, Dr. Salvador of Resident Evil 4 fame? Yeah, he's got a good... The village mate. He's got, got a great chin, face. So, yeah, he's got a great face. Uh, if you have a tree, um, like, in your home uh, that's that's causing issues, if there's one in your garden, like, sucking up all the moisture and all, yeah. the, all your flowers are suffering, uh, don't worry... Just send Dr. Salvador around, and he will uh, fix your issue. Uh, he'll bring his chainsaw or the safety equipment, and he'll chop your head off. What? Uh, sorry? What? What was that? He will fix the issue, bring all of his equipment around. Yeah. Fix the issue, bring and chop your head off. And tree, surgery. The... tree surgery. Tree surgery. Tree right. surgery. When you say chop your head off, I'm assuming what? you're meaning he'll chop just the heads of the, the bushes off, I right? I didn't say that. So he'll... What? I thought that's what you did. You not say no, that? No, no. I said he'll 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 get his chainsaw. He'll come round. He'll come round. Yeah, no. And then he will yeah. he'll solve the problem. Right. That sounds great. Oh, and he sorry. What was that? What? No. no. What? Hello. Do you know what? What? I got you. What? I got you. You did not. You this, didn't. This just in. Get out of town. Fake. You're a madman. Fake sponsor. Fake S news. Someone needs to stop you. Yeah. This is outrageous. Welcome to CNN, where everything's fake. Apparently. Is that true? No. Oh. Well, according to the POTUS, it is. Oh, the POTUS. Yeah, you, you guys are fake news. Your organization is terrible. Brilliant. What a world. Yeah. The real sponsors are, of course, the patrons over at patreon.com forward slash team triple jump. We have various tiers over there, financial tiers, where you get different rewards like Worst Games Ever Early or joining in an exclusive Patreon Discord call every month. Uh, but if you are, are able to donate just $1 a month, you could feed a Tiny Peter... For a whole year. Mm -hmm. And also it gets you access to the podcast post where we ask for your questions. So if you want to ask questions, why not consider going to patreon.com forward slash team triple jump. Just as... Bonoffi did. Bonoffi did. Bonoffi did. Just as Bonoffi did did. Bonoffi did it. Uh, Bonoffi has submitted a question which yeah. says... Hello, BP and TP. Hello. If you could introduce one feature to a console that's not been done before, what would it be? I'd like my console to dynamically light the room I'm in so that spooky moments are dark and thematic, but I can see to reach my cup of uh, my cup of tea during cinematics. That's that's a great idea. Yeah. I've 
seen some TVs that have special LED backlights on them mm-hmm. uh, that that light up depending on what's going on on the TV. Right. And they're so cool. Mm-hmm. I watched a small clip that someone sent me. Someone was watching Star Wars Episode Eight, the really the really good one. Yeah, you know that great one. Yeah, one yeah. thing you can say for that film is it has some quite striking colors at times. The cinematography in that film is actually really good. There you go. Yeah, Peter Austin loves Episode Eight. Confirmed. Confirmed. So while while all the I think it was our, our war scene mm. and the big explosions and stuff, the lights were just going crazy, like with these reds. Oh, and like behind the telly. The co- on the yeah, backlight. all over the wall. Nice. It's it's very it's a cool idea. I don't know if a console would be able to do it, but it would be cool if there was perhaps some sort of peripheral for mm. the console you could plug in that would allow you to do that yeah. uh, natively. Do you have any ideas, Peter? If you could, uh, the PS Five's coming out. Mm. Mark Cerny calls you up. He says, uh, "Hi, uh, uh, Peter. Uh, it's uh, it's Mark Cerny." Uh, is it Columbo? Just wondering if you could. Sorry, Col- it sounds like Columbo. This is Mark Cerny. This is this okay. is how Mark Cerny sounds. Right. Wondering if you could um, help help me design a new thing for the PS Five. I'm something of a scientist myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've got an idea, Mark. Yes. Um. It's it's technology that has been done before, but never in a console. I really like the, I really like the idea of smell vision um, No, you don't. I do. I do. You want smell vision well, in your house? Well, I want the option for smell vision Right. I want to be able to turn it off when I'm playing Resident Evil Four, for example, and you jump down the poo hole. Uh, <laughs> there's no poo hole in like there's a gar- there's a garbage disposal. Resident shoot. Evil Four looks like it smells bad. Yeah, most of it I think probably does smell of the plops, but there's not an actual poo hole there. Okay. Um, but yeah, there's a garbage disposal unit that you jump into, and Ashley's first line when you were when you when you get to that cutscene is, "It stinks." Okay, I, I don't want to smell that. But I think that smell vision could be could genuinely be like really immersive in certain situations. I think, you know, Im- immediately when you hear the word smell, yeah, you don't necessarily think of the sense of smell. You think of the word. It smells right, and it immediately puts negative connotations in your head. Like okay. the whole sense of smell is overall a negative one, I right. would say. But think about how nice, nice things smell. Give me a game that would smell nice. Uh, Journey, maybe. Right. What does Journey smell of? I mean, it wouldn't necessarily smell nice, but I think it would smell quite evocative. Right. It would smell Wistful. like yeah. It would smell s- like adventure. It would smell like you know, like the smell of heat on a really hot summer's day, like hot yeah. asphalt, hot asphalt. <laughs> uh, hot okay. asphalt. A, a, a game that would smell really nice. Go on. Uh, Spyro, in the yeah. in the meadows. I was yeah. just trying to think of a game with meadows, and that was the first one that came to mind because I'm Peter Austin. If we're if we're t- if we're if we're gonna get serious about this for a second, B Simulator. My yeah. my problem with Smellovision is mm. having been to numerous, and I'm not saying that the technology technology couldn't evolve further, but having been to numerous 4DX 40 cinemas, cinema yeah. experiences, the smells that they pipe in are inherently artificial smelling. Right. So you wouldn't be able, you would not be able to get a smell that smells bad necessarily. I don't think they'd be allowed to sell them for a start because they wouldn't be able to be too unpleasant because they wouldn't. Cause people would weaponize it probably. You mean legally? Legally, or... I don't think they'd be able to but produce can... smells that would be that bad. But you can get that liquid ass in Yeah, a well, that's what I mean. They wouldn't, they would not put that in a console. You would not put liquid ass oh, in see, a console. Oh, I see. You mean because they, because Physically within the console, there would be the chemicals that are able to produce. Right. So this is coming from the console. Even if it's coming from a peripheral, nobody is going to want Resident Evil 8 compatible with liquid ass. Right. No one's going to want that. I think you'll plug it in. Mm. You'll use it once and go, isn't technology amazing? And then you will never use it again. I don't think I would. I think no. I, I wouldn't want there to be liquid ass inside my console. The I liquid to- ass. Totally inside agree my with console. you. But I would I would like there to be the smell of like fresh linen, mm-hmm. um, you know, nice flowery meadows. I find that like particularly when I'm traveling and if I go on holiday to a different country, one of the things I enjoy just as much as like the sights and sounds are the the nice or new and interesting smells. You're so old. Place. I am, I am very old. I, I remember when I went to Las Vegas when I was like 14, mm-hmm. which is 
It's not a good age to be in Vegas because you can't do anything. You had a great time. I had a good time. Um, Vegas smells really nice. Like out Isn't in it? the street, it smells of like sort of cinnamon and vanilla. They, is it to try and lure you I in? I think they, it might very much be like an artificial thing that's piped out by various hotels. Like Subway. Yeah. Every but, subway smells the same. And, and it, I've never really been to a place that smells quite like the streets of Las Vegas did. Mm -hmm. And it's things like that that I think they really take you away. You know, like how certain smells can like suddenly um, f like fire off a memory on your, in your head from something yeah. you've not thought about for like a decade. Mm. I think like smell, if, if, if utilized very well, can actually elicit like even not like emotional responses, but it can it can like really like be a memory aid or it can help like fix a memory so that like the game that you're playing right now if there's like a smell accompanying it then when you smell that later in life mm -hmm. you'll think oh it's like that time i was in that really like nice field in that game that i played <laughs> i know you're sort of joking but I cannot for a, for a second imagine a world where we let our games consoles stink up our living rooms. It's, however pleasant. It's a fantastical uh, <laughs> pitch. I'm not, I'm not right. genuinely saying... He's not going to buy a PS5 yeah. if he can't have stinky spy. And if by the PS6 they've not done it, then I'm going to you know just get rid of all gaming from right. my life. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying if I could be a little bit wild yeah. and get Mark to just do something a bit crazy, yeah. I would get him to put smell of it. Mark is crazy. Crazy. Yeah, he, he is. made two that game. Crazy Mark. He could he could do more, yeah. more damage. I think Loco Roco would smell nice. Yeah, I think it would smell like uh, those gel pens you used to get in, in secondary school and primary mm -hmm. school. You know, yeah. Not that I ever had those, but there we go. I had the Tesco equivalent. Smelly gels. Yeah. You know what I would bring? Mm -hmm. Something way more practical. Right. That could actually happen. Quick start and quick save functionality to consoles. Yeah. Quick so save should definitely exist. Quick save. I feel like you, yeah, it should. And a lot of games do let you have several save files. But I think in terms of actually doing sort of a save state, so, you know, when you put your console into rest mode, that's essentially a save state, but you then can't quit the game. Mm. Uh, but when you turn it back on, it will pick up exactly where you left off. I want that, but I can save specific, like you can with emulators, mm -hmm. like you can with PC, you know, certain PC games and stuff. I just want to be able to hit a button and there's a there's a there's a capture of that specific instance in the game that I can go back to mm -hmm. if I mess something up. And I realize that would be rampant for cheating and naughtiness. But I feel like you know don't insult our intelligence anymore. I want to be a, if I want to do it, let me do it. Well, that's what Stadia talked about, isn't it? Aren't they? Yeah. They've they've sort of said that. And you can be, share those instances. Yeah, with other you people. can share like a, an exact uh, you know a whole load of um, kind of parameters and uh yeah an entire situation with like enemies over there yeah like a perfect save state essentially let's wait until they get more than 20 games on their platform first yeah, and, then, no, and then then we'll see and the other one quick start this is something they actually showed off at the beginning of the ps4's life cycle Killzone shadow fall was one of the games to do it where you would start up the game and it would be at the main menu within a matter of a couple of seconds it didn't mm. mess around it let you just get straight to it and straight to the game. It feels like we've regressed massively, especially playing the Bioshock collection. Borderlands is a really bad one for it as well. You've just got so much crap you have to wait through mm -hmm. every time you start up a game. The, the audio engine, the, the, the physics engine, the developer, the publisher, the satellite studios involved, the license holders. Mm -hmm. It's all just this long parade of pre-game credits that no one cares about. Yeah. And it just stands in the way of playing a game. This is one of my pet peeves, actually. But it's the fact that we already saw how it could be right. at the beginning of the PS4's life cycle, and we've just regressed massively. Maybe on your first boot of the game, it should show those logos. Because yeah. I understand that those companies want, you know, they want a little a little name check. Uh -huh. uh, but yeah, like once you've opened the game once on your console, it mm -hmm. sort of ticks a box internally and goes, I agree. you have looked at those. It should be like a license agreement. Yeah. And ultimately, those companies don't deserve any more credit than the individuals who put the game together. And mm. everybody skips those anyway. And yeah. they, they only get seen right at the end. And usually they're skippable nowadays. I think there was a, a period of time where credits were more often than not unskippable. Mm. Um, or there was a benefit to watching them all the way through so that you kind of had to. you get like a secret ending. But mm. nowadays, I... I very rarely sit and let the credits play out, kind of thinking, oh, but what if there's a secret thing? It could be a I don't, They don't tend to do that there. anymore. They're just skippable. Um, the best one was Telltale, mm -hmm. 
where you skip the credits and it says Telltale will remember that. That was, right. my, that was my favorite instance of that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I just think we're wasting enough time. Mm -hmm. Can we not? Can you not just let us get to the game, please? Yeah. Uh, you know, they're talking about Spider-Man running on the PS5 architecture and there being no load times at all. Mm -hmm. When you're fast traveling between areas, you can just go to it and it's done. But how many Marvel logos am I going to have to sit through before I can even start the game up? Yeah. It should just be start application. Oh, there's a menu. Brilliant. We're mm -hmm. ready to go. Don't waste my time. I mean, some of it is, is hiding loading, really. Right. But I guess loading part the of your point is that like, you crazy. shouldn't. Yeah, well, I agree. Yeah. But unfortunately, that's the case. Like the, the Crash Bandicoot and Saint Trilogy ones, mm -hmm. uh, there was an update eventually where now you can pretty much skip past... Uh, some of it anyway, yeah. but um, initially it was hiding a very long loading screen <laughs> just to boot up the menu. Yeah. Um, Don't yeah. have as extravagant a menu. And also the next generation hardware is going to be significantly more powerful. Mm -hmm. There's no excuse now. There's definitely no excuse then. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the reason is literally, as you said, they just want pe everyone to know mm. who is responsible for bringing you this game. Go and buy our other games, please. I've already bought it. Don't waste my time. The glitches you're about to experience were brought to you. Courtesy <laughs> of Bethesda. Yeah. Excellent. Well, those are the three very real things that will be coming to your console very soon. Mm. smell o vision is available right now. Yeah. Store dot <laughs> triple, triple jump, jump. dot mup yeah. dot store. Brilliant. It's time for another section, Peter. It is. Are you ready mm -hmm. for what we play in? Yes. <laughs> Peter Austin, mm -hmm. tell me what we play in, by which I mean you, by which I mean Peter Austin. Right. Uh, we, as in me, as, as in, in Peter, Peter Austin, Austin yeah. uh, are playing um, more, of that, more of that Crash Bandicoot, actually, which I Ooh. literally just mentioned in the previous question. Um, I've got one uh, more gold relic to do. Okay. And uh, you're, you're going to do it. You're going to do this thing. I'm going to do it. It's hanging out. There's no G. Hangin. Oh, like well, there what, is a G. Like what we play in. But yeah, yeah, it is. Wow. Uh, hanging out. It's one of the sewer levels. Mm. Um, and uh, it's the one with the, there's a lot of monkey bars to do. Um, and there's there's blokes dangling down with like flamethrower y things. Those blokes. Yeah, those blokes. What are they like? A lot of little spiky hover, hover boys, spiky hover boys, mm. nitros to jump over. And uh, God, like the target time is is very tricky. And you've got to do it pretty much perfectly if you want to get the gold. Flip you. <laughs> Flip you guys. You can do it, though, Peter. Yeah, I can. I believe in you. Um, so that's mostly what I've been doing this week is just in terms of gaming is uh, just trying to get those relics. Uh, finish Resi on my streams. Hey. Resi 4, finally. How did you, how'd you get on? Yeah, it was good. Um, I didn't realize that it would be finished in that last section. I knew that I'd be doing another three-hour stream because I've just sort of – I decided – some weeks ago that like, well, all the streams are going to have to be three hours long if I'm going to get through this anytime soon. Yeah. I knew that I'd be doing another three hour one uh, this week. And then uh, but I didn't think I would get to the end of the game in it. I thought it'd still be like two hours left. Mm. Uh, and then when we got like to the sort of second hour, I was like, God, if I, if I do a three and a half hour stream, I could do this. It'll then. be done. You yeah. son of a gun. So we did. Brilliant. Um, and then people in the in the chat were saying, so you're going to be playing the the mercenaries missions afterwards? <laughs> no, <laughs> mercenaries Definitely missions. Not. They're just score chasers. I mean, it's all. Fun. There's some really good like extra content in there. There's like an Ada campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, there's like loads. You know, like uh, it's like the Resi Two remake. Like you finish the game and suddenly it's like, <laughs> but wait, there's a lot more. Hang on a minute. Um, so which is it's it's all good stuff. And I've played them at home in my own time, like uh, some years ago. But I won't be streaming them. No, uh, it's time to move on to something else. I see. But yeah, it's been fun. What are you going to stream next? Oh, I don't know. I said I'd do a poll. Um, I, I really have no idea. And, and people were doing suggestions in the chat and coming up with like things of wildly different categories. And like lots of people were supporting all of these different things, like saying, "Oh nice. yeah, play a creator game, like you know, Planet Zoo or mm. uh, Two Point Hospital." And then other people were saying, "Oh, go back and do do some some Spyro and Crash uh, remakes." And then other, you know. It's all, it's all crazy stuff going on, so I've got to even just choose a category first before I even decide on a game. It's tricky. But What if people suggested the game that if smell vision existed for PS5, mm. would smell the best? 
Yeah, which game would smell the best? And Peter won't play that. Let us because he wants the below. stinkiest game. Yeah. Stinkiest game. Let's go for that. Liquid ass the game. Oh. Uh, ben. Yes. What you play in. What what I play in. Mm. I finished off Bioshock at home. Yes. Bioshock 1. Bioshock 1. Mm -hmm. Excellent game. It is very good. Very, 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 very good. Really enjoyed it. And uh, you know what? I can't really fault it. There, there, is, there are some bits that were a little tediums, mm. especially as I'm now streaming it and I'm having to do them again. Right. But can I let you know something? Yeah. I think I, uh, I think I might go for the platinum. <gasps> what? Yeah, I think I might do it. What are the trophies like? Well, I've got to finish it on the difficulty above hard, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure if that's available right off the bat. It might be, mm -hmm. uh, and also not use any Vita chambers. So get through without dying, basically. God. Which I think but how should do you... be possible. What happens if you if you die? Like, what happens? You just got to make regular saves. Right. So you can just reload. No, but, oh, so you didn't just go and reload it. Yeah. In fact, isn't there an option? I think there's an option to turn off fighter chambers when you launch the game. Oh, there the might game. be, actually, yeah. Or maybe only in the hardest difficulty. Mm. So, yeah, I think you could probably do that so that it's not going to screw you over. Either way, it's not going to be a great deal of fun. But I'm thinking I might... I might go for that. Mm -hmm. I was watching a speed run last night, you know, for research purposes, and they were playing it on easy. However, and this may just be on PC, but they did point out that telekinesis is massively overpowered. Oh, yeah, I've seen you can jump over all kinds of doors. You can, Yeah, so you, if you jump on a suitcase, for example, and then use telekinesis, you can launch yourself up in the air and jump over barriers because the way that most of the game is constructed, which when you are aware of this can, especially going straight onto Bioshock 2, which I will talk about in a minute, mm can make it a little frustrating because this is just... Bioshock 1 gets away with it, but then when Bioshock 2 repeats it, mm -hmm. it's like, ah, uh, okay. Um, where it shows you the way out, and then and then a big door comes down and says, no, yeah. you've got to spend two hours here first, and then you get to leave. Mm -hmm. um, and you can just bypass that whole thing by yeah. just leaping over it, which I think is very, you know, um, if I can do that, I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give it a go. Bioshock they might have two. tweaked it though for the for the PS4 version. I don't know. Maybe it, it may not work. In which case, I'll have to do it legit. Yeah, you Isn't will. that horrifying? Mm. Bioshock Two. Mm -hmm. Hey, it's good. God, I thought you were about to say hate it. No, I like it. It's good. I think isn't I think it? it. I think it is good. Yeah. It, it it is very much the definition of what we were discussing the past the past couple of weeks, where it's more Bioshock, mm. which isn't a bad thing. I've, obviously, it it suffers in some senses purely because Bioshock was so magical because it was kind of the first game to explore those kinds of themes, you know, going to Rapture for the first time. Yeah. And then in Bioshock 2, you're stomping around as a big daddy, who is still vulnerable, mm. but it does remove a lot of the tension. It's a different experience in that sense. Yeah. I still am enjoying being in Rapture. I'm, I'm enjoying, especially as, as I've been watching so many YouTube videos right. recently, going down rabbit holes about the history of Rapture and mm -hmm. stuff. It's nice seeing more of the lore and the world expanded upon. Yeah. And I like that. Um, I don't think it's as good as Bioshock, and I don't think no. many people would, would disagree. Mm. But you know, I am enjoying it. I'm chipping away at it. I'm going, you know, I'm doing maybe an hour or so every every couple of days. Mm -hmm. um, and I am, I, was, I suppose I'm my, my own worst enemy with, with the Bioshock games because I exhaustively check every room for everything. Yeah, me I look too. For, I look in all the containers, I pick up all the stuff, and so it can be pretty slow going at times. And because Bioshock 2 is more, it has bigger areas and it's more open-ended than the original Bioshock, sometimes when I get into a new area, it can be sort of a bit daunting. Yeah, and I have to turn it off for the night because I think I can't immediately, because I see like three doorways mm -hmm. and I just think, oh, tomorrow, yeah. <laughs> I'll do that tomorrow. Uh, but it's good. It's a mm -hmm. good game. It's a good game and I'm glad I'm playing it. And I'm good. looking forward to to continuing. Um, well, I'm pleased because I, yeah. I've i been, you know, when, when we've talked about Bioshock in the past and you've said, oh yeah, I've not played Bioshock 2, I've gone, oh, it's really good, you know, people say it's, <laughs> it's rubbish. Peter Austin, full of nonsense. Yeah. No, it's good. Could have been could have been bad if you'd uh, not enjoyed it. I do but, like it. I do like, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes. Good. We've got another question here from another fantastic patron called Rory Kison. 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 Can I have, have you got the Kison? You've got a Kison. Come a little bit closer to the Rory son. With the upcoming releases of Persona 5 Royal and Pokemon Sword and Shield DLC, which model is better for the consumer? Is DLC released so close to launch just content that was removed from the base game and sold as extra? And is an updated re-release just an attempt to double dip into customers' pockets? Hmm. What are your thoughts, Peter? It's a good question. I mean, it's something that 
I'm guilty of saying, even though, you know, do I really understand the internal goings on of a developer and publisher? No, <laughs> I don't. But I, I'm very much guilty of like, if DLC comes out within the first month, go, oh, why wasn't that in the base game? They clearly had that ready. Yeah. It was clearly ready. Yeah. Why don't they just put it in uh, and get, you know, really mad about it and, and feel cheated? I, I still kind of think that that might actually be true. Um, mm. As much as I, you know, there's the caveat of, I don't understand how these things work, but like, that must be the case, really, that that anything that comes out within, you know, say a month or two, they could they could really have had that implemented for the launch. Mm-hmm. Um, and it does feel like, you know, back in the days when DLC didn't exist, that would have just been in the game or it would have never existed at all. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it does make me feel a bit cheated. But then, on the other hand, I I can't necessarily comment on the idea of, like, an updated re-release just, you know, like double dipping into customers' pockets because if I bought a base game and then a re-release came out with, like, some extra stuff, I don't think I would buy it. Unless it was one of my favorite games ever, mm-hmm. um, I would just go, oh, okay, well, that... That exists, but I'm not interested. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, so it's it's hard for me to comment on on whether those things are worth doing, or maybe maybe I am in a position to comment because the point is that like I don't want to buy the game again. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully, the DLC included is also available to download separately in time. But uh, yeah, if if not, if it's just a special build with some extra stuff, I might still just say no. Unless it's a big game Sod in off. my life, yeah. Get the flip out of here. What about you? Well, it, these two specific examples that Rory's given here, as far as the overall argument surrounding DLC and stuff goes, I mm. think it, it depends. <clears throat> Excuse me, it depends. I get very emotional yeah. about it. I've got a few examples here. So Persona 5, for example, mm. uh, we're talking about Persona 5 Royal. It didn't get a Game of the Year edition. Mm-hmm. And on the whole, I'm okay with games... Game of the Year editions because they usually have all the DLC in. Yeah, Persona especially if that fine. DLC is available as DLC. Yes, it's not just extra content released in a in a new version of the game. Well, Persona Five had a lot of DLC, but it wasn't story DLC. It was skins and various attires and stuff like that. Nothing that gave you an advantage in the game necessarily, but mm-hmm. just sort of visual tweaks. You could get the uniforms from previous games and stuff you know the fun things that if you know fans might want to buy if they wanted yeah. for a small price so i believe persona 5 the royal not only includes all of those but it's the same sort of move that they do with all of the persona i think they've done them with most of the persona games certainly persona 4 had persona 4 golden which was a massively enhanced version of persona 4 with new uh a new character a whole new season, as in like a uh, you know a season of the year. Mm-hmm. Uh, so loads more story, additional content. Basically, they just extended the game massively by adding in more stuff. Right, and that's what Persona Five Royal is for Persona Five. Mm-hmm. So not only is this a game that includes all the DLC, but it's also just an enhanced version of the game that it, that is extended with more stuff to do. So even if you played the original Persona Five. This goes, Persona 5 Royal, as a specific example in this instance, goes way beyond what a uh, what a, a traditional Game of the Year edition would do, which I think a Game of the Year edition is fine in and of itself. Mm. And then, when you're talking about Pokemon, again, in this instance, that's a contentious one because I believe the DLC is Pokemon. <laughs> They're adding in Pokemon. And they a lot of people were very rightfully up upset that actually a lot of important Pokemon were missing. It was a problem at launch, yeah. 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 And now they're adding them in. But you have to pay for them. Right. I don't like that. A lot of people don't like that. That should that's not right. Mm. That doesn't sit right with me. But that is that is an unusual example because Pokemon does not usually have DLC. And certainly not to add Pokemon that people think should have been in there from the start. Yeah. If you're talking about early launch DLC, you can't really go much further wrong than Mass Effect 3 which had a party member that was DLC at launch, right. which had its own quest line and played into the whole story. And if you didn't have it, which I didn't, you just didn't experience a good portion of the game. And it was available immediately. The argument absolutely could be made and was made that that character should have been part of the game. Mm. Uh, DLC that early is not usually a good sign. No, DLC um, at launch is always... DLC at launch is never excusable yeah. unless it's cosmetic. 
you yeah. know, little things. Even then, it's a bit like, well, mm, okay. Couldn't I have earned this in yeah. game? You know, I understand pre order incentives and so on. Mm. However, Swinging things the other way in the interest of balance, if you want an example of DLC done right, look no further than Borderlands 3, mm -hmm. which not only is doing life service stuff, which I'm not a massive fan of, so there was a Halloween event and there was a yeah. Valentine's Day event as well, but when you get the season pass, what they are working on now, as well as having a team obviously to fix stuff that's that's going on and adjusting the game, yeah. They are making the big story DLCs. And the first one came out at the end of, the, of last year, as I spoke about on the podcast, the Handsome Jack DLC, which was excellent. And it was about four to five hours long. That's a good DLC. It came out a few months after the launch of the game. They've clearly been working on that since launch. Right. And then you've got more to come in the future as well. That's how to do story DLC, mm -hmm. in my opinion. So I feel like Borderlands 3 needs a shout out as an example of how DLC can be done right. Mass Effect 3 as an example of how DLC can be done wrong. Yeah. In this instance, Persona 5 Royal is a good thing because it's a more enhanced version of the original game. And, you know, people who've never played Persona 5, this is the definitive version to play. Uh, but Pokemon is not good. I they agree. Uh, I think what I should clarify is that I don't have a problem with Game of the Year editions in and of themselves, uh, especially since, like, it's uh, it's a great way to if there's a game that you've missed, um, you know, in its initial in its heyday, uh, and if you want to then go back and play that game, if there's a Game of the Year edition available, it means as you say, you can just buy it and all of its DLC in one go. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, all I'm talking about is certainly in answer to Rory's question is. Um, if a, a sort of game of the year edition style game uh, is an attempt to double dip on an audience, then yeah, I certainly yeah. would never buy a game twice just because it's got DLC bundled with it, mm -hmm. unless possibly it was like one of my favorite games of all time and I wanted to right. add it to my collection. But, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, there we go. Hopefully that that clears that up a bit. DLC can be cynically implemented and it's mm. not always good but sometimes it can be done well and extend the life of a, of a game yeah and uh, an enhanced version of a game is is never a bad thing if, if it's done right and i think persona 5 royal is is doing it right yeah peter yes ben it's time for something strange it's time to shuffle some papers are you ready yes for well, weird news It's time for weird news. It is. Have you got some weird news? I've got some weird news right here. Go on then. It's from Polygon. Mm. Uh, Patricia Hernandez. Okay. Thank you, Patricia. Um, Spider-Man artist explains how he designed Peter Parker's nipples and bulge. Brilliant. Yeah. Can't wait. Tell me all about it. Okay. Here we go. It's actually a very long article, but about halfway through it, it goes off on a tangent about other video game nipples. Oh, so brilliant. Fortunately, I only have this to is important stuff. Read half of this. Every video game is composed of a million little details that someone, somewhere, had to make a decision about. And in Marvel's Spider Man, which lets players sling around in Peter Parker's underwear, it means that someone had to decide how to depict Spider Man's nipples and butt. Mm hmm. Midway through February, environmental artist Ryan Benno made an amusing viral tweet about the process involved in, design in designing a video game character. Video games are great because somewhere, right now, there are artists in a meeting room debating whether to have a character with nipples, what possible options to explore, uh, what possible options to explore varying nipple looks, it says. Okay. What options to explore varying nipple looks. Uh, and how out of scope or out of tone are nipples, he wrote, speaking generally. Former insomniac character artist Xavier Coelho Castolny Brilliant. riffed on the thread, revealing that he sculpted Spider-Man's nipples and is likely the only game developer on Earth who can say that. Coelho Castolny, I'm going to have to say that a lot, mm -hmm. is also responsible for Peter Parker's three chest hairs, he tells Polygon. Wow. Great. In an email, he explained that all suits in the game, including the infamous Undies outfit, had to get the green light from Marvel. Marvel, in turn, sometimes gave the studio incredibly granular feedback on what Spider-Man should look like. To his surprise, however, Marvel didn't really interfere with his bare-chested Peter Parker. Uh, for that suit, Coelho Castolny told Fanbyte that while he didn't design Spider-Man's model, he was responsible for the character's muscle detail, skin texture, and the particulars of his anatomy. 
But to get Peter Parker's, nip Peter Parker's nipples just right, Kohelo Castolny told Fanbyte that he had to use plenty of shirtless references, including even looking at himself in the mirror. Wow. Speaking to Polygon, he also added that he'd uh, also had to think about Peter Parker's briefs for the undie suit as well. For instance, he had to decide on how high the underwear rode on Spider-Man's hips and whether or not the briefs had any wrinkles or flaps. The resulting design depicts Peter Parker in unwrinkled, low-rise trunk briefs which show off the V-shape of his lower abdomen and the dimples on his lower back. How specific, how specific does this get? Well, Coelho Castolny had to determine the stitches on the boxes because, as it turns out, some stitch patterns are con considered intellectual property. Oh. Which is crazy. We're wow. nearly there. We're okay. Nearly there. Um, picking Spider-Man's boxes also comes with another minute yet important decision. What does Peter Parker's bulge look like? Right. Getting the right balance between what's visible and what's not was tricky, he says. I settled on a bulge that was slightly larger than what's visible on the advanced suit, he says, referencing the primary costume that Spider-Man wears throughout the game. The logic there being that he didn't have as much constriction or support, so things would be a little more free to move around. Yeah. He also notes that observant fans may notice the undies suit gives Peter Parker a perkier derriere. Peter Perkier. We did it. Uh, that was just me being shameless about adding some beefcake, he adds. Fair enough. The article goes on, but we will end on beefcake. Brilliant. Well, that is weird. A thorough breakdown there of Peter Parker's Re body. Way more detail than anyone could have ever imagined. Let's objectify Peter Parker. Well, he's not real. No, he's not. So, uh, so it's fine. So that's fine. Yeah, we can objectify anyone. That's what I'm saying. Anyone. Because that makes it fine. Yeah. Would you like some weird news? This is from Nintendo Life, we know that one. Nintendo customer support goes above and beyond for 95-year-old grandma's busted Game Boy. Oh. A heartwarming tale, is what it says underneath. A heartwarming, a heartwarming tale. tale. Are you ready? Yes. A story has surfaced online over the past few days telling the story of a 95-year-old grandmother in Japan who received a pretty heartwarming response from Nintendo's customer support team. The grandmother's daughter, 70-year-old Kuniko God. Susaka, has stared... I know, old, right? Yeah. Really old. Well, people can be old, can't they? ...has shared the story in a recent print edition of Japanese newspaper Asahi Shimbun. Yes. She notes that her mother always had her Game Boy with her to enjoy games of Tetris, but when she reached the age of 95, her health started to decline and her Game Boy stopped working. Presumably that was those two... They're those, unrelated. They, no, they are related, right. presumably. Running out of battery. It's like you the know? grandfather clock it's difficult. That stopped when the old man died. Yeah, yeah. real. Yeah. Kaneko struggled to find any stores selling new Game Boys or anywhere that could fix the broken system in her hometown of Chiba, but her son mentioned that Nintendo offered excellent customer support. As it happens, when her son used the phrase Kami ta tao -u, yeah, well meaning God support or divine interaction to describe this excellent service, Kuniko misunderstood, thinking he actually said the word kami, meaning paper, which is relevant. Right. It's, it is relevant. This resulted in Kuniko, Kuniko sending her mother's Game Boy to Nintendo in the post, along with a written letter. Within a week, she received a response from Nintendo's customer support team, who said that they didn't have the necessary parts to fix the machine either. Instead, they found a brand new Game Boy in a warehouse and sent that along with a letter which wished the grandmother a long life. The... She's already had one. Yeah, give Wish it up. Wish that to someone else. You're going to feel bad right now. Oh. The Tetris-loving grandma lived until she was 99. Kaneko oh. said, up in the sky, she's thankful, I think. She's playing Tetris in heaven now. Yeah, oh. a heartwarming tale. That was that was a heartwarming tale, especially when the grandma died at I the liked end. it when you took the mick out. You were like, Haha, I bet I bet she's had more. She's had, she, she should just die. <sighs> and then she did. And then she she actually did. No, this, so this is a powers. slightly slightly older story, obviously, but it's just surfaced. Right. Um, isn't that lovely? It is. And a little bit weird. Yeah. The right mixture of weird and lovely, from the bulges to... Dead grandmas. The notion that someone can have a daughter who's 70 years old is... that It took me by surprise, that's all. Yeah? Even though I knew she was 90 so in the she story. she had a bab when she was 25. Yeah, 95 was she in this story. Yeah. Oh, right, okay, I thought she was 90. 
Oh no, maybe but, I mean maybe you're right. In which case, she had it when she was twenty. Twenty, yeah. Which is you know that's that's perfectly that's conceivable. Fine. That's but, fine. But when that's you, fine. When you think about it, it's that's fine. Just strange. That's fine. It's you great. could. I mean, if if one were to live a long time, one could have generations and generations of family. Oh yeah. If you all had Babs young. If everyone had a yeah, definitely. Imagine living to ninety nine as she did, and. Every kids generation twenty years apart had had yeah kids twenty years apart or or even sixteen years apart in the UK. You'd all be so old together. Yeah, weird. God, how fun! And the lowest or sort of the penultimate generation near the bottom would have to look after like six generations of elderly grandparents. They would. God, what a treat! Yeah. Tell me about question three, Peter. Question three. I think it's one for you to read out, but it's from Cos Cosad or Cosad Cosad Cosad. Uh, I think you should read it, though, because of... Uh... Okay. Oh, I'll read the first bit. Okay. Sup. No! <laughs> we should have that on the on the mixer, maybe. No, we don't want that. Nobody wants that. This is something that I'm sure someone has asked before and has been answered. But uh, it's seriously something that I always think about when someone starts talking about video games. And that is... Have either of you ever just come across a game that you had no idea what it was or about, uh, but it became an all-time favourite? I just remember going to Blockbuster, I'm not old, you're old, uh, around five or six years old at night, <laughs> and picked up a random game, uh, I know it is actually five or six o'clock at night, and picked up a random game called Second Sight for the PS2. I didn't realise how much that game sucked me in until I started <laughs> to see the Christ. sun come up at 6am. I've never gone back to play it again just because in my head it was amazing and I don't want to ruin the memory. Mm. Thanks for the lols, guys. Lol. Keep it up. Kozad from the US. Thank you, Kozad. Kozad went to the store at five or six o'clock. He's not old. You're old. Yeah. I don't um, think I ever bought a game from Blockbuster. I used to rent them from Blockbuster. I've never really rented video games in my life. You're not? No. I did it a few times when I used to cycle into my local town and rent a game from Blockbuster for the weekend and then cycle back. Mm-hmm. And I have to bring it back again. It costs like six pounds. Yeah. Quite reasonable, actually. Well, because I used to be more of a completionist than I am now. So I hated the idea of having to give a game back after like a weekend. That yeah. sounded like a horrible thing. Don't make me do it. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, games that we, we didn't really know about mm. and became all-time favorites. Um, I've just thought of one, actually, that's not in my notes. Um, and yeah. it's, it's already come up twice in this podcast. But I've just realized... Resi 4 is like the epitome of this for me. Yeah, It was yeah. given to me for Christmas, um, and I had no idea what like that it existed. I knew what Resident Evil was, but I wasn't really like keeping up to date on, on the latest happenings in mm-hmm. the gaming world. Didn't know this thing existed. It arrived at Christmas, uh, and I would, it's, it is one of my all-time favorite games. So that is exactly what this question is asking for. Excellent. Um, but the ones I did write down, uh, Halo Combat Evolved... I remember, duh, 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 duh. yeah. I remember going round to hip hop happening. Peter's young uncle, who's like a very much older brother, mm-hmm. his house, and he just got an Xbox. What is that? It was insane. It was this new thing that had come out, an Xbox. He had to arrange all his furniture around it in the living room because it was so massive. Yeah, um, and he lived next door to my grandparents, so we would sort of go around to kind of both houses at once whenever we visited. And I was at my grandparents' house next door, and my brother had gone next door to uh, my uncle and was playing on... I didn't know what they were playing on, but uh, I I then ventured round after about half an hour, and they were playing Halo. They'd mm-hmm. already booted it up, so they were just midway through as I walked into the room. And uh, I remember really vividly them killing one of the elites, which are the sort of large humanoid covenant aliens. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, it it was in this sort of dark room and there were all these um, plasma rifles going off, sort of illuminating the room. And uh, as as this elite died, it did, it did this long, drawn-out scream that it only does occasionally. It right. just sort of went, oh! And I was like, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> oh, this is crazy. It's intense, this game. And uh, that is also probably one of my favorite game it's not like top five material but it's one of my favorite games ever nice and uh that was that was uh a moment where i was like well i've never heard of this what is this mm-hmm. and it became a favorite amazing uh similarly for me 
in terms of your story with Resi 4 was the, as I've said numerous times, so I won't go into detail, when I got uh, Final Fantasy 7 from Electronics Boutique mm. and my mum picked it out of a bargain bin yeah. and gave it to me and said, what do you think of this? It's got three discs, so there's probably a lot of game to it. Yeah. And uh, I took it home, scared the crap out of me. Certainly did. Didn't touch it for a while and then dove back in and, and absolutely loved it. Uh, so that was that was definitely one that I got that I just didn't really know any I didn't know anything about. Mm -hmm. In terms of one that I didn't know much about, but then ended up having one of those experiences playing it until the sun came up was COD Four, oh, which yeah. I was reading gaming magazines at that point quite reliably. Every mm -hmm. month I'd get the magazine that I read, um, and I'd heard it was good, but you know I'd never really played Call of Duty before. I'd played Call of Duty Three on my friend's Xbox 360, but that was right. a, that was about it. And then COD 4 was just this absolute tour de force that no one was really expecting to be that good. And the multiplayer online was insanely good. Mm -hmm. Like nothing that, certainly nothing the PS3 had ever seen, yeah. really. Um, and so my friend had been playing it for a little while and I went to his house for, a, for to stay the night and uh, we went into town uh, to get the game and... Bumped into, I wasn't 16, so I couldn't get it. Right. I think I was 15. Um, and so they wouldn't sell it to me. You actually tried to get tried it. Tried to get wouldn't. it, wouldn't sell it to yeah. me. So then I stopped, I, one of my teachers was in town. Right. And I stopped him and said, would you mind, could you help me? And he was like, yeah, absolutely. And he came in, but he went up to the counter with me and said, this is one of my students. He is 16. And they said, that's, that's not how this works. We need to see ID or you need to buy it for yourself. And he went... Well, I tried, and I was like, oh, "For God's sake, that didn't work." As to, and then we so he broke into, the law, yeah, by doing that, and then didn't even did, go as went, far as getting you the game. He half-assed it. He totally yeah. half-assed it and ruined it. And then we bumped into one of my friends who lives in that town, and he was one of those cool, you know, rock and roll metal kids who hangs out, you know, with all the with all the people who definitely should know better mm. and who are in college or whatever. Yeah. Um, UK college, not American college. And um, and and one, one I, I've never met this guy in my life. I gave him 40 pounds and he walked in, nonchalant as anything, then walked back out with the game, walked past me and I was like, where's he going? And he was just going around the corner and then he gave it to me. Oh, God. I was like, ah. Ah, oh, and that's how I got my copy of COD 4. Then I went and I played the multiplayer all night until the sun came up. Fantastic. And it was amazing. Good game. It was a fantastic game. Another quick one. I randomly picked up a game called, I've talked. I've waxed lyrical before on the podcast about Stronghold, mm -hmm. the PC castle building game. Just picked that up off a shelf once from game. We used to go on the weekends into York sometimes, and uh, I would always just sort of, try and spend money on a game. I didn't really want to leave the game shop without buying something. Right. And they had a PC section, and I just saw this thing. I was like, oh, don't know what this is, but, you know, I'm not leaving here without spending 20 quid. So <laughs> bought that, and, uh, God, love that game so much. Still love it. It's isometric. It looks pretty grainy and horrible now by today's standards. It's like an old Civ, uh, not Civ game, Age of Empires game right? Uh, in, in looks. But, uh, God, great game. Mm. Love it. Excellent. Mm. Oblivion. That was one that I oh, knew yeah. about and was very excited for. But in terms of staying up all night and playing it, right. went to my friend's house. We had two TVs in different rooms, two crappy, you know, CRT TVs. Mm -hmm. Played Oblivion all night. Brilliant. Yeah. Used to, used to play Oblivion separately in our own homes, then go to the park to, to kick a ball around, you know, because you've got to get exercise. Yeah. It's important. And we would just sit there and or stand there and idly kick the ball at towards one another with no effort involved and just recount what we'd been doing in the game mm -hmm. and the experiences we'd had along the way. Oh, magical. It was magical. What a magical time. Games don't do that anymore. No. It's not because games have not because games are worse, it's just because I'm worse. Right. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Life goes on. Things change. Let's You're move less on. imaginative, maybe. Don't you dare call yeah. my imagination into question. It's rubbish. Could an, a non imaginative person do this? I don't think so. No, maybe. Did I even press it? Yeah, you did, yeah. Okay, good. Maybe I should press it again. I can't imagine what it would sound like if I didn't press it again. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. There we go. You've got one more, by the way, to use before the end of that. We need a quota, really, don't we? So yeah, we, we don't do. Overboard. Yeah. It's time, Peter, for a big discussion. Yes, it is. Big 
Big discussion time. Peter, this big discussion comes from Pim Van Barsen. Yes. Pim Van Barsen, who says, Hello, programmer Ben and tiniest of Peters, long time fan and, fi- and now finally a patron. Love what you do, so please keep up the sterling work. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I noticed that you don't do many racing games, and if that's not your thing, then that is fine. But do you think that, as technology and games develop, we could see certain genres disappear? For instance, when we all have autonomous cars, eventually, would we still have racing games? Do we see even now that traditional 2D platformers and the like are disappearing to be replaced by more and more expansive open-world games? Or will we all be hooked up to VR and that before long? Thanks. I'd say that they're... Just punch the table. I'd say that there are plenty of 2D games, actually. Yeah, I would. Um, there are certainly lots of open world games, but there's there's a lot of 2D games in this dystopian future where we're all being driven around by cars. Mm. Uh, there's still going to be a very, very strong contingent of people who want to race cars. Car racing will probably always be a thing. The cars will get more advanced. Yeah. But there will always be people who will have a skill in physically driving a car. Definitely. And also... I don't fly a plane. I don't drive a tank. This is going to be my answer, yeah. It's gaming is escapism. Tetris is proof that it doesn't really matter no. how the world moves. The, the for some reason in this in this industry, there will always be new genres and new things, but it seems that there's always going to be a contingent of players who are passionate about a type of game that they played when they were growing up. And yeah. so that I don't think there are really many genres apart from arguably rhythm action music games mm. that have sort of fallen by the wayside and aren't aren't really supported anymore no uh they they're, they're always they're always going to exist in some form i think yeah i agree i think um you know trends might change over time and yeah at the moment there's lots of open world particularly third person not always but third person rpg games um that you can kind of lump together into a, a kind of group homogenous group um and you know yeah there's a trend for that at the moment and over time things might uh develop as you say you know vr might become a bigger thing as they Mm -hmm. improve on the technology and there might be some really cool vr games one day eventually um but i don't think really any genre will ever truly disappear i think even you know 2d side scrollers um things like that, or like basic sort of geometric puzzle games and stuff, they'll always exist in some way, shape, or form, or certainly in the foreseeable future. I mean, maybe in about 60 years when me and you have a 70-year-old daughter. Yes. um, And uh, we are all maybe getting weirdly hooked up to VR for entertainment. There might be just a complete change of the medium in in ways we can't even imagine. Um, But for as long as we're sitting on a sofa with a console plugged into a TV, um, I think there's always going to be certain kinds of games. You know, pretty much every every genre that we're aware of now and that we still play will always exist. And you're right that the, the whole thing about self-driving cars, for example, you know, people are still going to want to uh, drive, drive cars and games, fly spaceships, things like that. Um, Partly maybe for nostalgic reasons, like, oh, remember when we used to drive cars? But also just, as you say, for escapism. You know, I've I've never flown a spaceship in my life, but no. I still like flying spaceships in games. Um, so, yeah, I don't think that will necessarily affect racing games. Also, hmm. I do quite like racing games. I yeah. just sort of never really think about buying them. And then, But whenever I go to someone else's house and play them, I'm like, oh, yeah, I love driving. Yeah. I love driving games. I suppose it's because I don't know if this if this is the case for you, but certainly for me, I also like racing games. I don't like simulation racing games. Yeah. I'm not a Gran Turismo fan. Mm. I realize I think that Forza is sort of a it leans it's simulation, but it leans more towards arcadey, so it is more fun. But I you know I, I love Burnout. And yeah, I, I love you know, Burnout. I, I've played Need for Speed games and I love kart races and stuff. I mm. I do enjoy them, but yeah, like you, I just never think. That's not what I would like to play when I go home. Yeah. You know, I don't want to play a racing game. I want to be sort of wrapped up in a story the or world, transported yeah. to a different land. And if I am going to sit down and play a racing game, it has to be colorful and interesting mm. and take me away somewhere, you know, somewhere different rather than just racing around wet Silverstone. You know? Paradise City. <laughs> it can take you there. Yeah, exactly. Where the grass is green. Mm. And, the, and there's everything there's liquid ass everywhere. S- smells of burnt tires. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. So safe. Mm. Such a safe city to raise a raise a family. Yeah. In. 
But I don't. I don't think you need to worry. I. I don't think. Um, no. I don't think things are going anywhere. They'll adapt. They'll change. You know. You look at. Um, uh, we. I think we've got a list going out next week about spiritual successes mm. uh, that you know that really do do their original games justice. And um, there's there's numerous examples in that list that show how time has moved on, but those games still sort of exist, but with you know they've just be, they've just grown with the times. Mm. You know they've they've adapted and changed, but ultimately that that genre is still there. You'll you'll still have a racing game in twenty years. I know that it may lean more towards Wipeout than it leans towards you know Gran Turismo Two, for example. Yeah, but there'll still be those options. You know you've got in Gran Turismo and Forza you can race around in those tiny Fiat Fiat cars mm-hmm. from the whenever's the sixties or what have you. Yeah, I don't know the specific decade. And and you will probably still be racing those against the latest jet powered cars. Yeah, you know, in in the future as well, just because it's fun and there's variety and it's great. You well, know? I, I wonder if um, self driving cars will actually end up uh, with people feeling. Um, uh, I I love driving in real life, right? Right. And if in twenty years time it's actually quite difficult to get hold of a regular car anymore, and like it's it's almost like the thing where no, you should be in a self driving car now. It's much safer. Mm. I will miss driving, and uh, it might make me want to play driving games even more than than right now. So you heard it here first, Pim yeah. Van Barson. Uh, when self driving cars become the norm. We'll all want to play racing games a lot more. Yeah. Not less. More. More. Not less. More. Not. There you go. That was my. That was it. Yeah. Well, there you go, Pim. Pim, Pim. Hope that. uh... Don't don't say that. What? Someone's name. Pete, Pete. It wouldn't be like me to ever insult anyone's name. No, absolutely not. No. Yeah. Well, there you go, Pim Van. Barson. 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 I said, but... Great. Yeah. Well done, Peter. Thank you so much for submitting your question. I, I hope that uh, hope that clarifies things. Why well, say clarify like this is the definitive answer on the matter? I hope that was an interesting discussion at the very least. And make sure you let us know what you thought of the discussion or what your thoughts are in the comments below about anything that we've discussed today, actually. Chuck it down there. And if you wanted to reach out in another way, Peter's going to tell you how. Peter's going to tell you how. He's going to tell you how with his mouth, with which he moves to make the noises. Are you ready for the telling you how? Mm-hmm. Team Triple Jump, wherever you look, we're there. Oh, wow. Uh, YouTube.com and Twitch.tv forward slash Team Triple Jump is where we do all of our content, mm-hmm. which Ben will tell you about in a minute. But we do streams there on YouTube and Twitch. And uh, Lord Brotovich and Cecil Prumps are looking after those streams, doing good things, stopping the swears. Uh Looked like you were about to lean in and say something, but you didn't. Sorry, nope. that really that really put me off. Sorry, it's just stretching. That's no, okay. Uh, Twitter.com and Facebook.com forward slash Team Triple Jump. It's our yeah, social no, no. medias. You can get in touch with us there, preferably by Twitter. But Luke Eldon is over on Facebook, and he will he he's looking after that. Yeah, God, he is. all these people looking after things for us. I know, aren't they brilliant? We've got a Patreon, Patreon.com forward slash Team Triple Jump, where we have all kinds of rewards. Uh, you can ask questions for the podcast. You can get worst games ever early. You can get access to an exclusive patron room on our Discord, which is bit.ly forward slash Team Triple Jump, modded by Jack and Joe and Crimson Dragonfly. Uh, the podcast is available in audio form at play.acast.com forward slash s forward slash Triple Jump. Mm. Uh, it's on Spotify and, and everywhere. Everywhere else. Everywhere. The website, triplej.mup. We've got a shop. We've got an empty careers page, which might soon have an, a position on it. Possibly. Hopefully. UK only, though. We need, to, so don't, we need to work it out. Don't get too excited. Yeah. Unless you're in the UK. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's it. I've done it, haven't I? You've done it, I've I done think. It all. Yeah, you've done it, I've I think. Done it. done it. If you'd like to follow us on Instagram, you can do at that Peter Austin and at Ben Potter20 on Twitter at that Peter Austin and at confused underscore dude. We do lists every Tuesday and Thursday. No lists this week, apart from one that I'll talk about in a minute. Streams every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. Monday and Tuesday being solo streams on Twitch, and Thursday being a joint stream blaze it on YouTube. Worst games is fortnightly. It's not the worst games week this week, but it will be next week. 
Friday is when patrons get it. Sunday is for everybody else. The podcast is every Saturday. Of course, you know that. You're listening. And we do sort of bespoke shows every other week or so. This week, we've got a Rules Boss episode going out. We have. Uh, in fact, no, it's gone out. So you should go and watch yes, it. Yes, because it's Saturday today. It's done. Yeah. Go see it. Uh, additionally, we did a Hugh list. Hugh list. Hugo list. We did a Hugo list. It is on Spider-Man games. Mm-hmm. Every single Spider-Man game ranked from worst to best. Every one of them. Every single one. Uh, written by Fleep, who's brilliant. Does all our Fleep long lists. Fleep is great. Fleep. Done, done all along this. Do a fleet. Um, and uh, that's available on the channel now, so go watch that if you want to see some Spidey goodness. Mm. Love a bit of Spidey. Spidey d- talked about Spidey earlier. Yeah. There's nipples and bulge. We did. Great. Finally, don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes or your platform of choice. It helps. Something to do with Al Gore, Al Gore's rhythms. Al Gore and his rhythms. Yes, Peter, what's today's sponsor? Dr. Salvador's tree surgery. Hey, hey. Is there a branch just getting all up in your business? Just it's coming in from Mr. 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 Norris's garden. Yeah. Over into your garden. I hate that. It's dropping like little inedible berries all over your your floor. God. Your grass floor. Hate it. Hate it. You wanna do you wanna chop it up? More than anything. Don't do it yourself. It's dangerous. No, it might hurt my back. Don't do it. Just give Dr. Salvador, Spanish farmer, a call. He'll come over from Spain yeah. with a potato sack on his head. He will get a chainsaw out yeah. of his van. Yeah, out of the van. He will put on some safety gloves. Some safety gloves. He will go into your garden. Go into our garden. He will chop. He will chop. Head off the branch. Chop your, sorry, what was that? He will chop head off. the chop branch. The branch. The okay, branch. Chop the, yeah. And you will be dead. Happy. Dead happy. Dead happy. You'll dead be ha- dead happy with wow, the service. That's fantastic. So just to reiterate, mm-hmm. if you want to find your local branch <laughs> Did I press it? I did. Of uh, of of this man's fine business, you just need to knock on Dr. Salva's door. Yeah? Correct. Yeah? Yeah. Great. Okay going to go now. Okay. Thank you so much for listening slash watching, everybody. We'll see you again this time next week. Take care of yourselves. Enjoy your weekend. Bye! Bye.